Let's talk now about OS organization. So we want to know how is an OS organized? I mean, there, there are two major aspects. So we might be interested in what are the components And also, we're interested in what are the interfaces? Okay, to those components. You might even, let's just back up a second and say, why do we even have an operating system at all? And that's a, a, a valid question. There are some devices for which you don't have an operating system. Okay, or you don't necessarily have to have one, some embeddable devices. Perhaps the operating system is really just some libraries that are provided that an application can choose to use or not use. One of the real reasons you want an operating system is to be able to provide some sort of multiple activities. Okay, that's certainly the case on your phone, on your laptop, and so on, that multiple things want to run at once. Well, Multiple things want to run. We'll talk about what it means to actually be running at once. Right? But part of what you want are these activities. You want them isolated. Okay? Except for certain circumstances, you don't want them to interfere with one another. Perhaps you want to allow one to read what another one has written, and so on. And the isolation can certainly um, have a range of different possibilities. So if you look at your laptop, any program, can read or write any file written by any other program, right? So they can go in and open any file that you have access to. Whereas on, let's say, iOS, any data that's created within a particular application is sandboxed from other applications. Another thing you want is multiplexing. That is the ability to share a single resource. So we look at time multiplexing, for example, if we have a single CPU, we're going to use that CPU for one application for a little while, and then use it for another application, and then use it back to the first, and then back to the second. So each of them gets this perception that they have their own CPU, but it's actually being shared across multiple applications. Okay. And then we have to have some sort often of interaction. We've seen an example of interaction so far, right, with uh, Unix when we were looking at the shell. So we looked at the fact that you can pipe the output of one program into the input of the other. And the shell coordinates it so that there is a pipe object between them. And so that the two programs are um, coordinating with one another, such that the output of one gets fed as the input of another. So that's one possibility of interaction, but there are others as well. One thing that's helpful in supporting mul multiple activities is some sort of abstraction. For example, we abstract uh, disks so that instead of dealing with raw disks, we deal with files, file system. Okay, and what other things do we have? We have TCP versus Ethernet. And actually, in Unix, we have an abstraction on top of TCP, which is just a stream of bytes looking you, that you deal with often the same way you would deal with reading and writing from a file, for example. Other abstractions we have, let's say, processes. are an abstraction of raw CPU and raw memory. Why do we like these abstractions? Well, they make multiplex they can make multiplexing easier and they can also make interaction uh, easier. Plus they add portability. So if we're dealing with raw CPU, raw instructions, raw memory, that could be very different from machine to machine to machine, okay? from CPU type, CPU architecture, and so on. And so we build up these abstractions that then can then be realized with some actual hardware.
so we can have sort of a realization one here and then a separate realization two here. That's why Unix slash Linux has become, one of the reasons it's really become so popular, Unix in particular, right, because the abstractions they provided are very portable and they have worked uh, and could be ported to many different machines and many different architectures. And that portability meant you could write programs once for Unix and have them run across a large number of different realizations. So XV6 doesn't have all that many abstractions. The major abstractions of XV6 are processes, file system, and IO. The processes, when we look at those, um, what are they? So we're really, we talk about, if we talk about multiprocessing, there are a couple of different possibilities. We can talk about multiprogramming. And here we have one CPU. And this one CPU is running for a little while for one program. So let's look at two processes, A and B, that are trying to run. Okay, So we have A, and it runs for a little bit of time, and then stops, switches, and then B runs. And then let's say A runs, B runs, and A runs, and B runs. And A runs. But this is a single CPU that's switching back and forth. Okay, What's actually doing this switching to switch the code from running A to running B? That's actually the operating system runs here and runs a little bit of code to do the switching and then runs a little bit of code to do the switching and so on. So it's not, oops, that one's not correct. It's not all time that's spent in either A and B, some of the time is spent in overhead to do the switch. Okay, so that's multiprogramming. We can also look at a multiprocessor. Which has N CPUs. If we looked at a multiprocessor that has, let's say, two CPUs, what we could have is A is running on CPU 1, and B is running on CPU 2. So here we have the illusion that they are running, because as far as A is concerned, A just sees I run, and then the next instruction takes quite a while, and then I run, instruction takes a while, run takes a while, and so on. Whereas in the bottom case, here, with multiprocessing, we have got, let's make this line actually, for multiprocessing, we have got uh, A running on its own CPU and B running its own, on its own CPU. Now there still could be a switching, right? If we had four processes on a two CPU machine, then let's say A and C might be switching and B and D might be switching. Or maybe A and B would run for a while, and then when B stops, D runs for a while. There could be migration between CPUs. Okay. But that's the difference between multiprogramming and multiprocessing. Way back when, when I was uh, you know, a young programmer, multiprocessing was very unusual. It was very expensive to have multi-CPU machines, and now it's just a matter matter of course. So we haven't talked about, we've used the word process, but haven't talked about what actually a process is. So if we look at a process, okay, the way I think of it is it's really a program plus state information, right, where a program, let's say, is the code. 
So we have the code of the program plus we have state information. So that state information is uh, some memory that's assigned to it. And what's the value of that memory? What's the value of the registers that are assigned to that process? And what is the value of some kernel data structures that are kept for that process? One way you can think of it is uh, a program. So let's say we have our code here. This is an, a recipe for creating a process, right? But in order to actually create a process, we've got to load this into memory, assign some memory to it, initialize some registers, and then start it running. So the process, this is sort of like the class, and this is like the object. And it's also worth noting, we could have multiple processes based on the same code. So for example, I can be running Vim on three different files at once in three different windows. That's the same code, different processes. We have this switching between processes that I mentioned. There is something to look at as a distinction in this uh, switching. So one possibility is A is aware when it switches, right? And A actually says at this time, I am willing to give up the CPU right now. And then B takes it. And then B runs until B says, I'm willing to give up the CPU time. And, gives it. and so that's normally called a yield. So we could have um, cooperative multiprogramming. And in this case, again, the process is aware of it, and it happens at a well-known time when the process says, this is an okay to time to do it. You can usually some call like yield. Or we can also have preemptive. Multiprogramming. Both Windows and the Mac OS started life doing cooperative multiprogramming. So, well, actually they started having a single program running, but then shortly thereafter, they added cooperative multiprogramming, where a particular call would allow another uh, process to run so that would get switched out, switched back. So the good part about that is you know uh, in the middle of some tight loop you're running, it's not possible that you're going to get swapped out. But uh, the downside was you had to make sure if you did not call this yield routine, what would happen? Well, if you didn't call the yield routine for five seconds, there'd be five seconds that no other process could run. Okay? And that could lead to these, to these delays. The good part is if you had a application, a process that required uh, lots of CPU time, required very responsive requests, then you, you, if, if you were running and you just failed to call yield, you would get nice responsiveness. Although both Mac OS and Windows started off with cooperative multitasking, eventually they moved to preemptive multitasking. Windows, I believe that was in window, with Windows 95. And for the Mac, that was when they moved to a Unix uh, underpinning, when that was in the early 2000s.